Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, in your bulletin this morning, you will find a little envelope, looks like this. And this is to use for this special offering today, the reconciliation offering. The ministry, this special offering is received each year in congregations on the last Sunday in September, which was last week, and the first Sunday in October, in solidarity with World Communion Sunday. And funds given are used throughout the year to actively develop and implement programs that promote our church's pro-reconciliation and anti-racist identity. These programs and efforts seek to reveal, to re-educate, and remove systemic and structural bar barriers in our communities that deny human thriving based on race. Your love for uh, your gifts to the ministry strengthens our church's witness to God's unending love for all humanity. With your generosity, leaders, communities, and our congregations are being equipped to witness to God's love and justice in all times and in every season. The time is always ripe to stand up for justice to ensure that all of God's children are treated equitably. Thank you for joining us on this journey by giving generously. Thank you. Today's scripture is from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bible, it can be found on page 919. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Brings us life 
paid the price to make us one. Amen. Well, I don't know how to tell you all this, but this is a dense scripture, and on top of that, we also have to understand the denomination's work in the reconciliation ministry, and so I don't have any jokes for you all today. We just got to jump into it. <laughs> what you need to understand about the book of Romans is the Apostle Paul, what he's doing here is he is aligning out every single implication of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the whole book, it, it operates like a kaleidoscope. Paul is kind of looking at what God did on Easter morning and tilting it around and seeing new images, new promises, new implications. And it's always the same logic of the resurrection, but it's applied not just for Jesus Christ himself, but all who are in Christ. And here in chapter 8, what's going on specifically is that we are being invited to see the eternal implications of our own lives being yoked to Christ. In other words, what, what the resurrection means for the afterlife, or even more simply, the fact that you get to go to heaven. And see, the thing is, Romans, it, it has that hope in heaven. It really does, but it doesn't pull any punches at the same time. It gets into the nitty-gritty of this life, even as it hopes in the next. Uh, to put it another way, it reminds us that we are in Christ, and being in Christ includes the resurrection, but it also includes carrying a cross. And Paul, he, he wants us to sort of go back and forth between the two, seeing them both, because whenever you balance both of them, you start to see the hope that he's talking about. 
but to get a basic grasp of it, really what we got to see here is how Paul characterizes the human condition, what it's like to be a human being. And we're told three basic things on it, and none of them are particularly happy. Verse 18, it tells us that the present circumstance we find ourselves in is at least going to be partially marked by suffering. No one gets through life without suffering. We will all get hurt. We'll all stub our toes. We'll lose friendships and family members. We ourselves will all pass away. And if that wasn't enough, it keeps going. It adds on in verse 20 that our experience as humans will not just be marked by suffering, but also by a sense of futility. We'll get stuck in situations where we wake up tired, where we slog through the day and then we go back to bed even more tired. We'll have a tire that goes out on us three times in a row for no apparent reason. You know, we'll spend weeks, this is a personal one, we'll spend weeks working on a beautiful garden just to have the longest, hottest, driest summer just come out of nowhere. You understand futility? I think you do. Well, as if that wasn't enough, suffering and futility, it adds on, verse 21, it says that the human experience is one that is bound to decay. The milk goes bad. Your knees won't work like they used to. The water heater you swore you just installed needs replacing. Those are biblical promises. You were promised three things in your life. Suffering, futility, and a bondage to decay. If you really want to dig in on that, first of all, I think there's a bigger problem if you do, but if you do want to dig in on that, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, we have a whole book of the Bible centered around the, the human experience. But for now, I did sneak in one joke, but it's, it's a Woody Allen joke. Let me tell you about that. Because Woody Allen, he gets at this at the beginning of the movie Annie Hall. Uh, he recounts a joke he heard. Basically, there's two old ladies complaining about the soup they're having at a restaurant. One of them says to the other, this soup is terrible. And the other says, I know, and in such small portions. <laughs> Woody Allen, he goes on to say, that's basically how he sees life. It's a whole terrible mess, and it's over way too soon. Well, the, the Apostle Paul, he would certainly agree. He continues this line of thinking, and now he starts to address the nature of human beings who are also Christian, folks like us. And he makes a few remarks about folks like us. Verse 23, even us who follow Jesus, who have the Holy Spirit within us, even we are included in the suffering, the futility, and the bondage to decay. We don't get a pass just for being Christian. We too will experience every sad and hard thing just like everyone else. So what good is there in being Christian? Well, Paul gives us some insights. He tells us that while we do share in the common human lot of suffering unto death, we have been given a glimpse of hope from God himself. Look to verse 22 with me. He, he describes once again the pain that is all but guaranteed to be present in any human life. But notice how he frames it. Describes it as groaning in labor pangs. Groaning in labor pangs. Now, I don't have any firsthand experience with childbirth myself, but I've been told it's a little bit painful, amen? Maybe a lot painful. Right? Especially back in the day when you, you didn't have medicine for it, anything like that. And yet, for those of you who have gone through giving birth, when, when you think back on that day, I'd reckon you primarily don't think about the pain. I'm willing to venture that you think more about the new life, the baby. Right? It's a long, hard process of suffering, of futility, of groaning and deep pain. And then, as a miraculous gift, there's new life. It's precious and beautiful. That's how the entire human condition is described here. You will hurt. You will cry. You will suffer for seemingly no reason at all. 
If you're lucky, only if you're lucky, you will grow old and nothing will work right anymore. Then you'll... <laughs> Weird laugh break, but okay. <laughs> but after all of that, what will inevitably happen to all of us is that you will pass on from this life. But the insight and the promise we have as Christians tells us that once that happens, we will be surrounded by new life. That's Paul's description of heaven, abundant new life. You know, he doesn't tell us every detail as if he knows he hasn't been there yet. But we're told everything will be beautiful. No more pain, no more mourning, nothing bad at all. It'll be a perfect gift. Right? It'll be like holding a newborn baby, but the way Paul's putting it here, oddly enough, the baby is kind of the entire world. Like, just like holding a newborn baby, the deep peace that washes over you. Everything just makes sense for a moment. Be kind of awestruck with the potential and the, the newness that is right there in front of you. If we are in Christ, when it's all said and done, our lives will include a cross and a resurrection. That is the nature of our lives in Christ. Suffering, futility, decay hardness at times. But when it's all said and done, just like giving birth, you'll look back and you will see so much love and joy and peace running through it all. You'll think to yourself, absolutely worth it. Big, a uh, little bit of time spent in the rainstorm, and then eternally, eternally it'll be as though God himself parted back the storm clouds and just started shining a warm ray of light onto you. Would you believe that Paul has even more here in Romans for us? Because he does. It keeps going, y'all. See, it not only gives us hope here of what God will do, it also provides instructions for what we do in the meantime. What do we do until we get to heaven? Again, Paul gives us yet three more insights. Verse 23 and 24, it tells us, wait in hope. Wait in hope. We haven't seen it all. We only get a rough outline here, but wait on it. Hope in it. Think of the next life like, like a Christmas present that you sort of rattle around and try to figure out the day before. It's going to be good, so don't fear it. Don't back off of it. You can embrace it and sort of get a, a handle of it. It keeps going, verse 21, and I quote, Obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Let me say that one again. He tells us to obtain the freedom of of the glory of the children of God. That's a mouthful. But what that's saying is amidst all the suffering and hardship of life, our job is to intentionally choose every single day to be glorious. Not perfect, but glorious. To be people that make folks want to burst out in song. And see, we're told to be, to be glorious, to inspire singing, in a specific way, we're told to be glorious in how we are children of God. While all of creation is caught under perpetual rain clouds, we're supposed to be the people announcing the sunbeam. See, we're glorious because we see the rain clouds, we experience the rain clouds just like everybody else in life, but somewhere in us, we know deeply that the sun is still shining. Whenever it's raining, that doesn't mean it's nighttime. The sun's still shining, it's just dim because the cloud's covering things. That's the image that I want us to hold on to today, that the storm will part and the sun's going to keep radiating out. It's still going to be there, it's still going to be glorious, and so during the rain cloud, we can anticipate that that's not all there is, that there's still goodness to come. We're glorious because, verse 19, we get to eagerly long for the revelation of the children of God. Another mouthful. What that's saying is that we are glorious because we get to know for ourselves and we get to inform others of an open secret, of great news. We get to be the people who tell and show and live out the fact that God himself longs for the day. He longs for the day when he gets to call each person we encounter by a new name, by the name child of God, beloved child of God. 
That's what God longs for, the day whenever he gets to look to every single person and call them that and know them as that. The role we've been given is to help God reveal to people that they are, in fact, his children, his beloved. Imagine what that looks like with me, church. We get to see people who are marked by all the pains of the human condition. People kind of like us. Suffering, futility, bondage to decay. And we have the joy and the responsibility to be the people who tap them on the shoulders and let them know through our words, through our deeds, through our infectious love for them, hey, your identity is ultimately and eternally known as God's own beloved child. I don't know how you've identified before. I don't know how you've characterized yourself before. I don't know what everybody else has been saying, but I just wanted you to know you are ultimately and eternally God's beloved child. It's the only title upon you that you will keep forever. And it's the most important title upon you. Christians, we are the people who know that God and his overflowing love will characterize our eternal and our ultimate identity. And so what Paul is saying here is not only do we get the peace of hoping in that, we also get to glorify God by showing that reality to other people, because some people don't know that to be the case. They don't feel that to be the case. We get to be the people that inform them, making sure they know it, making sure they feel it, making sure they walk with folks who see them through any pains that could distract from that. That is our individual and corporate role as Christians. We get to be the people who do that. Now, the denomination has rightly done some digging, discerning as to uh, how we do it best. See, while nothing replaces individual action, nothing replaces people who just take up a call and get after it, whatever getting after it may look like, well, that's always needed. The denomination resolved as early as 1968 to look upstream and to see the root causes that often distract people from knowing that they are, in fact, beloved children of God. See, what they recognized is that not all suffering, not all futility, not all bondage to decay looks and acts the same. Some suffering is just a part of life. Right? We all stub our toes. That happens. And yet, some suffering occurs specifically because of an identity marker, such as your gender, the color of your skin, things like that. In other words, some folks suffer specifically because they've handed, uh, been handed an identity, something that has nothing to do with God and everything to do with human issues. For instance, I'm sure many of us here have had the, uh, the experience, it's an experience of futility of going into a, a job interview and then not getting that job. I'm sure many of us have experienced that, but only some will know the experience of going through that and then having to think and run through that situation 50 times over in their head. Was that really about, I just didn't get the job, or... Did it have something to do with how I look? You know, did it have something to do with this or that identity marker? You see the difference? All of us, all of us, and unless we had the pleasure of learning from Brad Kidd or Sr., all of us will have to suffer through a history class. <laughs> we love you, Brad. It's okay. We'll be all right. But some of us, only some of us, we'll find it naturally interesting because we're learning about how our forefathers made it in this nation, whereas some others uh, will attempt to learn about how their forefathers got along in this nation, and it'll become a hotbed of a political mess. What's the deal there? Not all suffering is built the same. All of us will experience some suffering in life, some futility, some bondage, decay, all of us will have to carry a cross before we get to the resurrection. But only some will be additionally burdened, specifically because they've been handed an identity as this or that group 
rather than their ultimate identity, which is beloved child of God. The reconciliation ministry of the disciples of Christ, it therefore exists to continue the ways of challenging any of the times, any of the ways that, that people have and, and still work towards separating fo folks, towards putting them in certain camps and certain groups of identity markers. We're, we're attempting to overcome that. And the ministry, it's doing that because it eagerly longs for a day when everyone is able to see that they are God's beloved child, that that is their ultimate and eternal identity. People need to know that. They need to see that. They need to be able to feel that in real lived-in ways. And so what they're doing, it's, it's a more corporate angle of what we've all been called to, to trust in and to do in the Scripture. We are to trust in and to hope that despite the hardships of life, there is great news to look forward to. There is an ever-approaching day coming when we will know ourselves and every other person primarily, ultimately, eternally as God's own children. And we won't just know that as something in our head. We'll feel it. We'll live it out. We'll act like it. And so given that great hope, we naturally long to make it known before we get to that day. We long for many people to know that's your identity. That's who you are. That's how you should be treated long before we get to heaven. Christians are the people who are called forward to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to remind folks of their real identity as God's beloved. May it be so.